I'll go live stream on YouTube. All right. Okay, you are online. Um, hello, welcome to our uh, first seminar of the uh, our Math Plus seminar series. Uh, today we are together with uh, Dr. Dick Hartman, um, who is an industrial mathematician uh, at uh, Siemens. I will briefly introduce him and then I will leave the words to him. Um, he is graduated from uh, University of Heidelberg uh, with diploma in mathematics and physics. Uh, he got his master's from uh, University of Cambridge um, in advanced studies and mathematics and theoretical physics. And he got his PhD from University of Heidelberg. And currently he's working at Siemens as um, project manager. Am I right? Uh, close to right. So, so currently uh, I'm a technical fellow at uh, Siemens Digital Industries Software, heading the uh, innovation activities. All right. Um, today, the topic will be changing role of simulation uh, from mathematics to digital events. Uh, if you're ready, we can start, Mr. Hartman. Yes, I'm ready. And let me share my screen. OK, it seems like I'm not allowed to share my screen. I just gave the permission. OK, so I hope you can now see something. Yes, we can see it. It does work. OK, awesome. Um, yeah, so, so thank, you, thank you very much uh, for the very nice introduction. <clears throat> and um, I decided to tweak a little bit uh, the, the title and rather really folk on how we use mathematics in industry or more specifically at Siemens to drive innovations and, and as a, you know, use it as a key enabler for innovations. And in order to do that, I took a recent example I have been working on, um, which are so-called executable digital twins. And we'll get to that, uh, what, what this is all about. Um, but in short, this is really all about uh, with aiming to integrate the digital and the real world with the ambition to come up with better designs and more efficient ways to do um, innovation and in particular operation of products. Um, I would like to ask you also, so if you have a question, please feel free uh, to interrupt me in between. Otherwise, uh, I hope we do have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So I typically start um, these talks with introducing uh, Siemens a little bit more in detail, uh, because depending on, on where I am, um, you know, I get, get very often the feedback, okay, uh, Siemens uh, produces great fridges, great household appliances. If you're a little bit older, maybe even uh, refer to mobile phones, but this is not really any more Siemens. And rather uh, over the past decade, we had a transition yeah, from a more manufacturing and hardware centric company towards a software company. Uh, so um, over the 10 years, there have been significant investments into well, acquiring different companies, um, joining with different companies really in the software space, so that um, as of today, we are probably the leading provider of software technologies when it comes to the life cycle of industrial assets and, and products. Um, so, so from that point of view, um, our ambition, and that, that is, I always like to go back uh, you know, to, to the CEO of our company um, who puts forward uh, the, the claim or the goal that uh, we as Siemens are able to combine the real and digital world like no other company. So really, you know, not only managing the real assets, control and automation solution for those real assets, so, you know, factories, um, 
hospitals, buildings, trains, but also on the other hand, to manage them in a digital fashion, provide novel digital services, et cetera. And of course, at the heart of this is, is, is mathematics. Um, but I started with, with the, this, this executable digital twins. So digital twins is, is a key, key building block for us here. And I'd like um, to, to give a quick explanation of digital twins in terms of a short movie uh, we did together well, roughly um, two or three years ago, together with our communication department, um, explaining digital twins. And now I hope that the sound works. Um, if not, uh, we would just jump over the video and I would refer you to the corresponding YouTube site. So you could quickly let me know whether the sound works. Um, we cannot hear any sound right now. Okay, well, just a second, maybe it's on my... Okay, well then, then let's let's do it quite quite easy. I'll jump over that that video, um, and rather um, well, let me quickly go back. If you could take a screenshot uh, under this um, link, you would find or under that QR code, you would get a link to YouTube where you could take a look at that movie. Good. Um, so then let's let's jump really more to an explanation what this digital twin is is about. <clears throat> Um, I'd rather start um, you know, going a little bit backwards and, and saying, okay, this digital twin, though this you know, came to light by NASA or was introduced by NASA around 2013, 2014, that this concept of, of having a complete digital twin, so complete digital collect or collection of complete digital models of a product um, is, is not really new, but rather having predictive models in the virtual world you know, goes a very, very long way back um, again to NASA who came up with this concept um, you know, back to those times when, when uh, the first rockets um, had been developed. There was really lots of experts used those models typically predicting single physics uh, for troubleshooting, for understanding phenomena they observed. And, maybe sometimes for optimization. It was really a very specific expert tool. Um, and then over the time that became a standard tool in engineering. And uh, probably these days, uh, there is no product uh, being released to the market being developed, which has not been validated uh, upfront, at least partial by virtual tools, such as computational fluid dynamics, uh, finite element simulations, or more aggregated predictions on a system level, for example, for tuning controls. Um, so that is, is kind of a you know, useful tool for, for the experts now for, for quite some decades. And then around 2000, something very specifically happened. Um, the concept of model-based systems engineering really you know, has seen a major adoption since then. So companies starting to shift communications, exchange of information between the different departments from a document basis, you know, like words and Excel documents towards a model basis. So exchanging really requirements, uh, performance predictions in terms of models. So an example would be here, um, the car manufacturer uh, providing a model of, of a drive cycle towards the supplier of, a, let's say a motor, and then uh, the motor supplier could design his motor so to optimally um, or to have an optimal energy consumption for a given um, drive cycle. And then again, you know, he could hand over that model to, to the uh, automotive company and the automotive company could, could uh, validate um, the performance of that motor. And um, this is, is quite, quite an important shift because at that point in time, around 2000, 2010, it was really all about these models, these mathematical models. And, and the corresponding simulation on top became a good key tool for everyone involved in R&D. So from that point of view, these model-based paradigms are, are not new. What was then new around 2013, 2015, uh, when NASA came up with this digital twin, was really to say, okay, let's liberate these models, which we typically only use uh, during the R&D phase for the complete life cycle and try to leverage these models 
to make predictions during the operations, yeah, how to reduce energy, how to do specific troubleshooting, when to service products, etc. And that explains also a little bit this twin, um, um, this, this uh, name of a digital twin, because for all spaceships, uh, satellites, etc., NASA typically has a real physical twin somewhere in the basement. And those of you who have seen Apollo 13, um, yeah, pro probably have, have experienced that, at least in, in the movies. Yes, uh, Apollo 13 had issues, and then the NASA engineers in the movie went back to the basement tried to troubleshoot and came up with the concepts how to get the astronauts safely back to Earth by means of the real twin. And of course, that's quite costly. So the paradigm NASA came up with was to say, okay, let's try to replace these physical twins by means of virtual, by di digital twins, so all the models we aggregated during um, the R&D phase and, and use these models for troubleshooting. So that is, is kind, kind of the vision. And then, of course, um, you know, bringing all together those physics-based models, the ones you manufacture that, you operate that, you also collect data um, and make that available for everyone who in one or the other way would like to take decisions for assets beyond the R&D phase. Okay, so being a mathematician, um, you know, every you know, typical discussion is, is can, can we find really a, a definition of, of a digital twin? What is it? And I always uh, try to escape from saying, okay, this, this is the definition of the digital twin and rather introduce that more as a paradigm, as, as a concept, um, how to organize R&D, how to organize operations or services around products in general. Um, so this, this is an attempt to, to describe it. So first of all, it's a comprehensive set of digital models. Yeah. So there's one digital twin per product, but that digital twin consists of a set of digital models. And those are typically uh, physics-based, so really mathematical formulas which can be simulated. But then during the later stages, when there is data available, those could be, of course, data-based models or hybrid versions, uh, data combined with physics-based models. And we'll see an example later on. Um, and so people use that. Um, to substitute in a way for reality. Yeah? So in, to, to try out certain things. So how, you know, what would be the energy consumption if I change my operation scenario as one, one example, try to make that prediction the virtual world because it's faster, because it's cheaper, uh, because it can be easily, yeah, more easily optimized and then take that as a substitute for taking the reality. Uh, and this should always have a specific purpose. So um, I would not collect all these different models just for the sake of having that, but always with a specific purpose in mind. And that, that's quite important because without specific purpose, yeah, the digital models would, would not really have, have a specific use. Um, and then last but not least, all this should be seamlessly integrated. So I think this democratization aspect is quite important of, of the digital twin so that really everybody, maybe not everybody, but many stakeholders and in particular, beyond of the set of experts who created those models, um, can take benefit and can use the digital twin um, and make predictions of it. So that's kind kind of um, how the digital twin has has been introduced. And um, I think these days, if you look on the various industries, uh, the concept is really taking up and being very very much advertised as the future of, of industrial operations. And if you would even look, look a little bit further, these days, many people are speaking about the industrial metaverse. Um, so really blending or having a complete virtual representation, a complete virtual world, and then the different building blocks would be digital twins. But I'm not going to speak about that, but rather focus here on the digital twins. And speaking about the digital twins, um, well, it is kind of, um, old concepts during the R&D phase, so, so used in an offline phase where speed also does not matter really, or does not matter too much um, to optimize and simulate or validate products. And then according to those findings, updating a little bit uh, the product designs and through this iterative loop of validation and improvement come to an optimal product design. Um, and that could be, of course, humans or machine learning in the, the in this loop, um, updating them than the models. 
So that's the one hand side and so the other side will be really trying to mimic or copy this concept from the design phase to the operation phase. So while we have the real asset, simulate in parallel what would happen you know, if I change this, if I change that, or you know, using that information to measure things, um, to investigate things which cannot be investigated on the real machine, for example, because I could not open it up during operation, sensors missing, et cetera, and then use that information to improve the operation and to improve the control. Um, if you compare now this with, with the offline digital twin, so the digital twin during the R&D phase, that has, of course, completely different requirements. Yeah? All of a sudden, you need to be real time because you need to be fast or faster than real time, because otherwise, um, well, the operation would be faster than you could make decisions, what would make no sense. Um, you would need to, this would need to be used also by non-experts because yeah, not every operator, in that case of a motor, uh, would be an expert in digital twins or in simulation technology. And of course, it's a completely different nature because you know business models around that would scale with huge usage, number of products, and not really uh, with a number of licenses sold to engineers and experts. Um, and then the concept of the digital twin is really trying to bring that, that together um, because yeah, model predictive control, as, as if you look on the right hand side, is, is not a new concept that has been used for, for quite some time now, also in industry. But really, the seamless aspect is, is here the key new thing so that we can take RD models, push them forward to so automatically generate real time models from them. And then, while learning from the data, also feeding that data, that learning back to this um, RD phase to improve the design operation. So that is a little bit the, the concept um, I'll, I'll be talking in, in a couple of minutes. And I really would focus on, on the right-hand side, the online digital twin, um, because that is where, where new mathematics is really required, is currently taking place. And it is actually, in the end, enabling um, innovations people would have not thought um, being, being possible. And due to this, this yeah, glance of mathematics in, in, in that area, I'll, I'll focus in the following on that. Um, speaking a little bit about this vision, the ideas are, are not really new. And if you would go back 20 years in, in time, you would speak to, to the more probably more visionary engineers. They would have told you likely exactly the complete same story. Yeah? Not, not called digital twin, but to have these seamlessly evolving models updating, etc. So the question is, why do we now speak about digital twins? And why do I or, or the industry community really gets gets excited right now about that? Um, and, and there is a couple of reasons. So the first reason, and that's uh, what, what everybody is, is aware of, is, is Moore's law or um, well, we're reaching the limitations of, of transistor size, uh, what's possible on the silicon side. Well, there, there are more or further concepts how, how to keep, keep that law growing. And you see here a G, GPU, so massive parallel computing as, as one option. Um, so that everybody is, is aware. But um, yeah, being, being a mathematician, I always try to highlight that, that uh, mathematics and, and computer science in general is playing you know, at least equivalent, if not stronger, enabler for, for this. And uh, if, if you would go well, to, to the various uh, publications, typically I, I always go back to Siam CSE uh, white paper from, from three years ago, uh, where they really showed for, for a couple of, of applications that uh, the exponential growth from the algorithms or the capability of algorithms actually stronger than the computers. Uh, so if you would use an old algorithm on a new computer, that will be slower than if you would use a new algorithm on an old computer. Um, and in that way, you could say we have, we have here a double exponential growth, and that brings us to a capability um, in terms of predictive power, which we could not imagine of, over the past decade. Um, so that's more, more the capability side. And then equally important is really the usability side. Uh, in previous slides, I spoke a little bit. It, it's really important not only to have the capability um, for, for the experts, but also to take this technology and to give it to the hand of um, non-experts. And why, why is that the case? Uh, well, quite, 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 quite simple to understand. The number of 
engineers or, or sophisticated experts, um, universities produce these days. Yeah, and that's just limitation number of professor, professors, limitation of number of, of classes, universities in total is kind of limited or only slowly growing. This growth is, is far not sufficient enough to manage the complexity of, of the systems we are currently producing, uh, which are currently out there, the products, and at the same time managing the big challenges of becoming carbon neutral, et cetera. So the only way to achieve that, I believe, is to give these you know, very, very powerful tools also to non-experts to allow a broader set of, of people to make use of it. And so these novel computer interaction devices, human computer interfaces is, is an extremely important aspect in order to, to allow for that. And bringing all that, that to there, together, there, there is a wide belief in the community that this will really make engineering simulation widely available to support improved decision-making and improved decision-making not only at the R&D phase, but really throughout the entire life cycle. And um, specifically the operations um, aspect is, is the important from my point, point of view, um, because let, let's take the, the carbon neutral uh, challenge as, as, um, you know, as one aspect, we'll not be able to handle that by producing new products, yeah? because if we would now replace all the existing products with new products, first of all, that would generate already quite quite a big CO2 consumption, but also time-wise would not manage that. So, so really getting more efficient ways for the operation is, is uh, of, of utmost importance and, and to allow for that, uh, well, we really need these executable digital twins. Um, so what, what is this executable digital twin about or a wide, wide, why do we need it for the operations? Um, so typically also when, when I speak to people about, about operations and, and, and how to improve industrial equipment, then everybody gets back to what is known from the internet of, of people. Yeah? Um, because obviously, well, motors produce lots of data and, and there seems to be lots of data available from sensors. So why not use machine learning as, as you know, we, we know all these success stories from the internet of people. Um, but speaking of industrial, the um, industrial internet of things, um, first of all, we don't have that much data as we do have from the internet of people. And in a way, the internet of people is um, quite similar. Eh? We, we all like nearly independent of, of from which country we are. We, we like similar movies, similar books, etc. cetera. Um, so, so, so in the end, as humans, we, we are quite similar. Um, whereas, you know, if a motor runs in a car, it runs in a, in a process plant, that, that's quite different. So, so data is, is not really alike. And, and then we don't really have big data for many industrial applications. And the other point I like to make is, is really the type of decisions we take are, are of a different severity. Yeah? If in the internet of people, I, I just got recommended a wrong book, well, okay, I, I maybe, maybe spent a few dollars um, for, for nothing, but, but that, that's not, not, not too bad. Yes, if, if I do something wrong on the industrial side, operation, the process plan as one example, that could harm humans or at least cost, cost easily hundred thousand of dollars. Um, and this is not really applications where you would like to use data analytics alone, in particular, if you only have small data. So that's why really to go into this operation phase, I think the digital twin is, or these physics-based models is, is of key importance, in particular that allows us to reuse all this nice knowledge we generated during engineering. So, but if you'd like to do that, um, you can ask, or we did a survey, what, what is actually the issue? And we already spoke about lack of experts um, to build these real-time models. Um, missing calculation power, that, that's probably not, not really an issue. And we spoke about Moore's law, um, but the big issue is, is definitely as of today, the usability and, and complex software landscape. So this is where we came up with this concept of the executable digital twin. Um, so, so what is it? Um, so the first aspect is it's a self-contained executable digital behavior of an asset. Yeah? And to compare that, I put that a little bit in, in position of today's 
models as we know them in, in R&D. Yeah, we have our physics-based model written in formula, maybe a geometry, um, et cetera. And then we need the tool to do the prediction. Yeah? If you have a CFD simulation that would be Navier-Stokes equations, we would have the specific geometry and then would need our CFD solver to do or to calculate, um, uh, for, for example, the, the, the CV value of, the, of a car or, or whatever. And um, so that would require that that tool, which would require enormous compute power in most cases, would require typically an expert to set that tool in place, to set up the model and run the tool. Um, so the key idea here is, can we take that knowledge and liberate it in a way in an executable fashion so that we are not only handing a model, but we're handing over an executable, like, like an executable you would have on your computer, um, which you then can run and execute um, whatever you would like to understand how the system would behave. And so in particular, anybody should be able to take that and run that at any point in the life cycle. Um, so what is behind that from a technology point of view? You can imagine that, and I always try to, you know, the, the most simplest approach here uh, to explain how that work uh, would be in terms of machine learning. Yeah, you could take your engineering model, which you, you know, have validated, which you trust, um, and, and which the engineer anyhow set up, and generate lots of different data points from that, that model, but for different parameters and operation conditions. Yeah? If you would have a motor, you could, for example, see how that motor behavior changes for different environmental conditions, for different speeds, for different torques, et cetera. And let's take the thermal behavior, so predict the thermal behavior for all these different kind of models. Once you have generated enough data points, you could train a neural network from that. And then this neural network, you can, you know, it's much smaller than the original model. You could easily package that and do predictions based on this neural network. And this is kind of, of what is behind the concept of the executable twin. Taking pure machine learning is a little bit oversimplistic over because we all know it's, it's more interpolation, extrapolates in many cases, not that well. So, so in, over the past years, we have developed much more sophisticated technologies to, to address that. And I'll look now, I'd like to look now with you into to a couple of, of real world examples uh, where, where we use, have used these kind of tools um, to really do more efficient operations of, of products which, which nobody could believe um, to, to work if you would have asked them a couple of years, years ago. I took here on that slide a quite big overview on what, what is possible where you could, could use these, these different um, you know, executable digital twins. You could use that for virtual testing, commissioning, finding right control parameters for more the classical R&D, these things. You could use it for virtual sensing. So instead of using a real sensor, using a sensor based on a simulation model, run the simulation model, and query from that simulation model, let's say temperatures at certain points. Um, you could use these XETs for doing diagnosis identification. So if you see a strange frequency pattern trying to solve an inverse problem, which tells you, you know, is it the bearing what is going wrong? Is it something else what is going wrong? And based on this diagnosis, doing a much better informed decision, you know, when to shut down, for example, plant, doing performance prediction, you know, running what if scenarios, what would happen if I increase the speed of the motor? How would the performance change, et cetera? Last but least, of course, you could do that, the performance optimization, and then drive that, that automatically. And the two examples I brought for today is the performance optimization on the one hand side and the virtual sensing uh, on the other hand. Uh, let's start with the performance optimization. Um, and, and the use case I've chosen here is robot milling. And um, first of all, because I, I, I really like to work with, with these big machines uh, on the one hand side, but also on the other hand, um, you know, when we discussed about this concept a couple of years ago, everybody said this is not, not possible at all. Um, so, I mean, you, you might have seen in, in various movies, uh, robots milling foam, milling wood, um, but they are typically not used for milling metal. And here it's milling aluminum. And the typical forces which occur if you mill aluminum um, is around 400 newtons. And 400 newtons uh, or a force of 400 newton is enough to push away the robot um, 
or the tool center points. So there where the milling tool is uh, by a millimeter or two millimeters. And the millimeter and two millimeters being pushed away, so being off from, from the target pass, um, means the produced part um, you know, has accuracies which, which vary from, from you know, being exact to one to two millimeter off. And that, that is not consistent all over the part. And that is not usable in industrial context. So that's why you know, typically everybody said you cannot use robots to perform milling tasks. Now, what we did is uh, we took a digital model of the milling process on the one hand side and uh, the robot behavior on, on the other hand, predict the magnitude of the force and the direction of the force from that force, use the real time multi body uh, model of the robot, how much it will be deflected. And once we know, okay, now the robot will be one millimeter off in that direction, and then the robot compensates in the other direction and by that um, reduces the error. Um, let me explain uh, roughly, roughly what are the different components, how mathematics enters here. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth on, on the next slide. So the first issue was um, where we needed to, to, to think about and bring in mathematical algorithms is how can we resolve geometries? Uh, such a work piece could have a geometry of several meters. Uh, that's also typically the size of what, what, where the robot can go and what the robot can reach. Um, but the resolution we need to predict the forces is, is really somewhere in the sub-millimeter scale. Um, so we took here a voxel-based representations so that's kind of something like hexahedral fine elements or so voxel is the 3D analog on of a 2D pixel from computer graphics um, and, and found a way how to formulate these dynamically changing geometry models efficiently in, in such a description. Um, then of course, you would like to have a prediction of finite time. So GPU parallelization was, was a big thing here. And then in the end, once we have those forces, how to seamlessly integrate them really on the controller side, because um, we need to do here a prediction every milliseconds or every you know, one to five milliseconds, because that is kind of, of the control cycle of the robot when it, or how it takes decisions. And then if you do that, you can increase the power quantities um, in particular, and that, that was important for us, this is not database, but uh, these big parts, you typically have lot, lot one, yeah, produce only one or two. So you cannot allow for many experiments or many failures. So this really works uh, once off, you, you have the control program and you need no manual tuning. And by that, you can really look at completely new applications. Um, so let me quickly wrap up a little bit how, how that works. Uh, so, so you start from how the final design should look like then predict the pass or plan the pass, how the robot should move over time to remove the geometry. And then you simulate that complete material removal, how the geometry changes over time. During this, you calculate at every point, how much is the actual milling tool interacting with the material. And so how much material is removed and then you calculate so the removed material is called chips, uh, the thickness of those chips. And from that, you can predict the forces. This you can do all offline because anyhow, there is a step where, where this manufacturing process is planned. And then you annotate um, the machining program with, with the forces. And then you bring that to, to the operation phase where such an executable twin representing the robot. So it's a multi-body model of the robot predicts and the exact behavior um, how the robot would be, would be deflected due to that force. And then you can compensate for that and due to this compensation, um, increase the accuracy of the milling. And here's the, here's the example. So that is, is uh, without any compensation. So you see uh, on the different sides, the robots is, is quite, quite off, plus, plus the explanations why, why this is happening. Uh, but what's more important, if we switch on that compensation, you really get to a quality where you're 0 0.1, maybe sometimes 0 0.2 millimeters off from the ideal geometry. Um, but that is really close to, first of all, the repetitive or accuracy of, of the robot. Yeah? 0 0.1 millimeter is, is about what you can expect the robot to, to be accurate. And on the other hand, this is really an accuracy which is sufficient for, for a number of, of uh, milling tasks uh, in industrial application. In this case, it's, it's roughening or so-called roughening operations of robots, where it's all about removing large parts uh, of the material. And then afterwards, um, 
there comes the, the, the fine machining part well, that's really then in a micrometer scale because uh, our eyes can, can see difference on a micrometer scale. And as I said, without this, this mathematical things, having those fast enough real-time models, I'm calculating appropriately upfront how much forces you know, occur due to these, these enormously uh, very high resolution requirements in, in um, the parts to be machined. Um, so without all this mathematics, we would have not entered here. And, and this is really a paradigm shift in a way we, we are trying to achieve in, 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 in this milling um, business, because up to now, the, the standard belief is if you'd like to do milling um, and, and you, know, you need really, really super stiff machines, uh, which, which means lots of metal, very strong bearings, quite, quite expensive, and you would increase the accuracy in the end through hardware developments and not through a simple piece of software and mathematical algorithms to, to achieve that. So that, that will be the first example I, I am brought with me uh, today. The second example um, is what, what, is, or what we call is, is virtual sensing. Um, whereas performance optimization is probably at, at, at the very, very one extreme, yeah? extremely fast predictions, automatically optimizing some part of, of the operation, the virtual sensing is a little bit more and more basic. Um, the key idea is uh, we try to use a simulation model, run that in parallel to the operation, and by doing that, taking sensor values from the simulation model rather than um, taking real sensors. And the use case here is a use case with large drives, so large electric motors. Um, we built a small proof of concept uh, using tiny motors. Yeah, a large motor could be of the size of a room, is uh, typically used or very often used in the oil and gas industry. And a key challenge is, is for the operation of those, estimating the temperature on the rotor of that motor. And uh, for various engineering reasons, um, mainly for, for the sake of guaranteeing reliability and in any sensor you would place on the rotor um, would, would, would decrease uh, the, the reliability um, in, in the end of that motor because it could, could break. Um, so you cannot use sensors to measure rotor temperatures. And, and um, the rotor temperatures are very critical for the operations. So what we did here is develop that virtual sensing concept um, to estimate rotor temperatures by means of simulation. Uh, so what we basically do during the operations phase uh, during, during the R&D phase, you have these big thermal three-dimensional models uh, predicting the temperature behavior. We took them used reduced order modeling technologies. So, so exactly what I introduced earlier with you know, analog onto machine learning. Um, so you can take a model with million fine elements, typically running you know, minutes, if not hours, and bring that to a model which has only, I think in that case, 20 degrees of freedom, so which you can really run in real time. And of course, real time here with thermal effects, yeah, that's, that's probably enough if you have a new information every minute. Um, so, and then we can take that model, run it in parallel, uh, as I said, to, to the operation, and uh, the control could take sensor values from real sensors on the starter side of the motor, and as well put a virtual sensor, so a quantity, which is here of interest, maximum temperature on the rotor and take that as additional input for taking control decisions. Um, on top, what you see here is a very, very nice uh, visualization on that. Yeah? So we could use a Microsoft HoloLens, an iPad, and have an augmented overlay um, of, of those, this virtual model with, with the real motor um, to get a little bit more insight. But I always try to stress that for this use case, it's really about maximum temperatures, not too much about the temperature fields, but this virtual or augmented visualization has been extremely useful and important uh, for increasing acceptance um, of, of, of potential users. So and again, lots of mathematics in inside here. Um, so using model order reduction technologies, and I'm gonna have another slide to look on that. Uh, we are able to increase the speed of the simulation by, by orders of magnitudes. So in that case, uh, 
four times uh, four orders of magnitude. Um, there is a continuous calibration uh, taking place. Yeah? We still have uh, sensors on the start starter side, and we use those um, to predict temperature on the uh, or to, to calibrate the temperature, and then to have a um, as reliable as possible um, temperature prediction for the rotation part and also to, to add uncertainty quantification on top of it so that we know, you know, with a likelihood of 99%, the max or whatever, the maximum temperature on the rotor is, is below this degree of freedom. And the immersive user experience, so the mixed uh, reality technologies, though this is not really crucial for the use case for the application, but it's more about um, increasing the acceptance because in the end, we need those non-experts yeah, to trust the solution uh, to put, put it on a real motor. Um, all this is nice. This doesn't require any additional efforts. Yeah, thanks to these, this mathematical tool chain of model order reduction, really start from those 3D engineering models and, and bring that down to this real time uh, models. Um, so calculate here, yeah, may, maybe reduction 20% of the stop times, and that can save enormous costs in the oil and gas industry. I'm a little bit to, to the mathematics behind. Um, so this is, is actually not uh, the specific mathematics we put behind uh, the motor use case you have seen. Um, so the, the mathematics here is really more some, some more recent results we, we did. And you can see that's not a motor, uh, but it's a multi-tubular reactor. It's probably not too much important that we speak here about the very detailed use case. Just would like to give you a feeling what kind of technologies are behind that. Um, I said that the first idea would be we generate a huge set of snapshots for different parameter combinations, et cetera. Then typically we look in this huge space for a representation uh, in, in, in a smaller dimension. So that could be, if you're on the machine learning side, will be autoencoders, diffusion maps, or if you take more mathematical approach, I would say it's a dynamic mode to, to, dynamic mode decomposition, proper orthogonal decomposition. So which is all about you know, using a singular value decomposition in the end to find a linear projection to a low dimensional subspace so that you could go from those millions degrees of freedom to a much smaller um, space in which you can identify models then and, and do the predictions. Um, that's an important point. Also identifying those models for most of these industrial codes you don't really or also many of the open source codes, you don't have access to internal part or hard to figure out which internal parts to, to extract to do these projections. So then you can discover those, those, those reduced models by means of what's called DIME, uh, disc discrete empirical interpolation methods, or simply by neural networks. And you have lots of data points, so maybe you could, could learn a neural network or operator inference, um, which is, you would assume a polynomial form and actually one can show that many models like CFD you can cast into a polynomial form. form. Also this reduced space would keep that polynomial form, form and then try to identify those polynomial matrices corresponding to that polynomial. And if you do that, then you can you know, have a prediction. Um, what you see here is top and bottom. This, the top would be a full CFD simulation with right of 1 to 1,000 degrees of freedom. And the bottom would be here really on the right-hand side, a prediction with our ODE with eight degrees of freedom, of course, that's significantly faster and using the projecting back. So in that case, it has been linear projection. So you can always take the transpose to go back to the full space. And you see it maps quite, quite nicely the accuracy. Um, I could also go, but, but rather would skip that so that we have a little bit more time to, to discuss. I go a little bit into you know what kind of POD we used, operator inference as a method, how we change that, um, how to bring in machine learning here um, or novel concepts from machine learning. But I would skip skip over these um, two slides because that's quite technical, um, and rather come come to the wrap up. So I hope I, I could convince you really, um, yeah, how, how how mathematics you know, really evolved over, over, over the couple of decades from, from a useful formalization, useful concept, algorithm box to do all these R&D validation you know, and the standard engineering tools all the way down to, if we really speak about operations, 
optimizing things on, on the speed so that you can, can really influence these decisions so as an indispensable tool um, for, for driving, if, if not enabling the, these innovations. Right? In particular, the two I've shown you, the, the first and the second one, without mathematical methods to, to manage these extremely complex geometries or to enable these ultra fast real time models without uh, additional efforts, yeah, what would have not, not been possible. Um, to, to get to this point. Um, and so, so that's why I, I uh, really, really think that, that for, for, for us mathematicians, um, the, this new concept along with digital twins, and I haven't spoken at all about, about the industrial metaverse, is um, really a, a, you know, a com completely new great, great age um, to, to get involved also more on the application side and directly take take algorithms, uh, mathematical concepts to, to innovations uh, in, in relatively short timeframes. And with this, I'd like to close, um, open for, for discussions and, and please also feel free, uh, you know, ask me technical questions, ask me how it is working in industry, um, et, et, et cetera. So thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, uh... Mr. Hartman, we can take them also on Zoom. It seems like we have no questions. Um, well, there's one question from chat. I guess you can also see. What kind of nonlinear models do you implement into the process? Um, so, so it always depends on. You know, first, my belief is, is is always trying to to use linear models. Yeah, and and in the robot case, um, what what you've seen that's actually all linear models, um, and you're still with simple, uh, not simple, but with sophisticated linear models, you get to the accuracy. If you look at the motor itself, also that has been a completely linear process, um, because it has been simple thermal models. Uh, the last example I've shown from the multi-tubular reactors, so that has been um, Navier-Stokes plus some uh, Arrhenius law, so, so nonlinear reaction kinetics. Um, so there we have implemented uh, those, those linear nonlinearities. In the end, it is always what, what uh, you know, physics prescribes in terms of nonlinearity. Also spoke a little bit with, with you know, combining machine learning and, and physics-based models. Um, and obviously, depending on, on where you look, um, you know, in many cases, people jump immediately to, to neural networks, which would be kind of the most extreme nonlinear model you get, yes, because you have no control on the function space. In a way, I uh, can get arbitrary nonlinear, uh, whereas my philosophy is whenever possible, I would start with a linear or polynomial mo model first, because that's kind of what, what I got taught. And I guess uh, still, uh, every one of us gets taught in, in their education. Yes, if a function becomes nonlinear, try a Taylor serious uh, expansion. And then that would be you know, low polynomial orders um, very often work. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions on Zoom or uh, in the classroom? All right. Um, thanks a lot for. Oh, there's one question from Klaus. Um, sorry. Okay. I can hardly hear something right now. Uh, can you ask again? Is there any study about the connection theory and information theory? Is there any study uh, on information and coding theory and simulation? Connection with the digital terms. Um, so information theory. 
was was there any additional twins? Um, so not that I am aware of being being actively used. Um, except that there is some some interesting work if you speak about an information and encoding. Um, so a typical problem we, we, we you know one, one can face in, in many of these settings is, is that the physics is not really no, known, that the heuristic formulas are, are not really known. Uh, and engineering practice has shown over the past decade, the decades that there is for many of these things heuristic formula. Um, but to find them is difficult. There's interesting work um, on on um, by Max Techmark um, identifying heuristic formulas for for you know given data. How would the formula look like? Uh, so Max Techmark looked at physics formulas and and he was able to reproduce with his machine learning basically all physics formulas you could uh, find in in Feynman's lecture. So he he coined that Feynman AI. And there, indeed, he considers um, so, so his loss function, the function, you know, how to judge whether something is is uh, is, is is useful or not. Um, he, he takes into account that that you know, if you would have a integer value that carries much much more information than what a real number would carry, and in that way. Um, there is some work, but I'm not really sure whether this is what you had in mind. All right, then. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there's one question from chat again. How do you customize equipment models with changing operation conditions and design parameters? Um, so the the, the that, that, that's actually a very, very, very good question. So a key challenge is, is um, you know, you could do all this already today. Yeah? I mean, they're, they're, the mathematical technologies are around there, but in order then, you know, if you would like to customize a specific model and many of the models, you know, we are looking up at our, our, our equipment is all customized. Yeah? So many of this, there, there's maybe one variant, two variants, whatever. So the whole thing is, is to produce or, or, you know, allow for a tool chain here why you can do that without little additional effort. Um, and so even if it's customized things, customized products, you would have the engineering models um, that's anyhow done. And so then uh, by using that tool chain, those model order reduction technologies, et cetera, um, it, it's all about how to generate and automatically those reduced order models. Um, so, so that would be the way for, for addressing that customization. Um, great. Um, any other questions from chat or class again? Um, all right, then. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your participation and your questions. And thank you, Mr. Hartman, um, uh, by with um, accepting our invitation for the seminar. It's been great tonight. Um, we, we can finish, I think. OK, well, thanks a lot, then, everyone. And then, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to reach out. See the, saw the email address on, on my last slide. OK, bye bye. Good afternoon.